when researching this app, I went on a bit of a journey myself, a bit of a trip. Um, and it started with watching your documentary, mm-hmm. um, Kids Wired Differently, mm-hmm. and then listening to your podcast, No Such Thing as Normal. Uh, I've read some articles. And I've got a six-year-old who I'm pretty sure is undiagnosed ADHD mm-hmm. and connected really strongly with a lot of the things you talked about. So uh, it, there's so much to cover mm, and mm. I, I'm not really sure the best place to start. No, but, me but, neither. <laughs> but I, I really want to get into it yeah. in depth. And, and perhaps it starts with 14 years ago you had twins and then over the last decade it's been an incredibly difficult and incredibly rewarding uh, and in, uh, just a, a, an absolute roller coaster of a ride. Mm. And I want you to tell our audience about, yeah, about it. Yeah, yeah. So my little, yeah, so I've got twin girls and my little, <clears throat> my little Nezzy, Inez, um, about at the age of six, I think, just stopped kind of just being able to, I don't know, function even, just, just sort of went downhill really quickly, just... Um, was wearing the same dress every day, was just really angry and and upset all the time and so many things, Um, but was holding it together at school. So, you know, that's fine. And then all of a sudden didn't hold it together at school anymore. So there were a few years there where she was just running away all the time, you know, pulling classrooms apart, violent, just, you know, I had the quote-unquote worst kid in the school and I was just... It was such a shock to me because to, up to that point, I was like, and I don't know if I ever consciously was aware of this, but I just thought naughty kids are the product of bad parents in a nutshell. You know, like what's happening at home? What's happening at home? So jump in there, not a parent. Yeah. That's my understanding. Yes. That's my take yeah. on it. When I see that, I'm like, what's ha- what's happening here, guys? And yep. like, St- like Stephen suggested I watch the doco in preparation for, and I did, and – even in the 24 hours since watching it, I'm like, man, I need to take a kind of step back as a judgy bystander and actually ask and be more inquisitive in it as well. Yeah, yeah. Because I think, <clears throat> and you know, we're at, we were very much at the pointy end of like things were so chaotic and so crisis level. But um, there's a whole lot of people, there's thousands of families that, are kind of in that at some level and are just going, I'm trying everything. I've tried the sticker charts. I've tried more discipline. I've tried the boundaries. I've tried everything and nothing's working. And everyone's going, it's me, you know? And it, it's very, it's it's so hard on so many levels. Um, and But, you know, now I kind of go, and yeah, it's been a journey, but now I go, what a gift because I'm, I hope, now a better, more understanding person and better parent because I now understand that my daughter's brain is wired in a completely different way and she's all those meltdowns and stuff is not her being malicious or trying to, uh, I don't know, get her way all the time. It's nothing to do with me. It's just that the world is really freaking overwhelming for her, really overwhelming. And she's, in a way, I'm kind of proud of her for going, nah, can't do it, can't do it, because there are so thousands of kids like her who have got it going on in the inside, but they hold it together. And then, you know, you see the problems later because that's not healthy. So she was just like, I can't, I can't. Um, yeah. A, a big part of the documentary and the story was talking about the worst of it and hitting rock mm, bottom. Yeah. And there was a an incident where she sort of ran away and there was a helicopter looking for her. Um, and, yeah, but it's, it's your story to tell, but the, the helplessness after that where – there, there was no. You, you thought, oh, okay, someone's going to come in and help mm, us, and there wasn't mm. anything there, which is the the power of what you're doing now and bringing awareness mm. to it. But yeah, yeah, that? that was such a pivotal moment because I was as terrible as it was. I, for anyone that has had a kid missing, it is hell, and you take yourself to terrible places. And I remember the um, <clears throat> hearing on the, one of the cops' radios, we got to search the waterways. And just going, oh, this is it. I'm in like some CSI episode. I don't know. It was just horrendous. But <clears throat> excuse me. But what happened was, I was like, okay. At least, sorry guys. <coughs> I'll start that again. <clears throat> um, what what happened was that I thought at least you know there was this little thing in my head going at least now they'll believe us that we that this is this is real. 
this is a thing. Is it's kind of what I say to everyone. This is a thing. It's not me being a neurotic parent. It's not like the parent. It's just we're not coping. And surely running away means that we'll have this team that swoop in. You know, like oh, okay, right. And so we've got the um, psycho- psychiatrist, psychologist, the this, the that, the support, the vi- whatever. And there was nothing except this guy that was just like, maybe you need to get a like a, a device implanted in her, like a GPS. Which I was like, what even? What? what? <laughs> like that, that was just kind of, kind of it. And then I was like, oh my god, they're sending us home, and we, we still have to like try and help our daughter. And I, I'm not. You know, like like one of the psychologists said to me, this is a PhD in parenting, Sonia. And I was like, hell yeah, because there's nothing. So, yeah, I that is, I guess, why I, from that kind of thing. Because the other thing is that I recognise that I'm in a position of privilege where I, for lots of reasons. And so, um, just... I don't. I know that I can compose the emails and you know do all those things. I will fight for my kid, and there are so many people not in that position for many, many reasons. So I have to be vocal for them. And yeah, that's the documentary I guess came out of that, and the podcast is yeah exploring things a little deeper. But it's such a complex topic, and no one story is the same. And I think there's just kind of messages that you need to get out there that you know this is tough. You were asking me about the, the other side, weren't you? Sorry. I feel like I've gone no, completely no, 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 off no, your question. No, but it, yeah. It's good. I, I want to talk about putting yourself, because you didn't want, like talking about the documentary, you didn't want to be the front of the documentary and let people into your life. No, but no. But you no. felt a responsibility to yeah. do it. And then once it went out and you could see why you had to sort of be the face of it, what was the response like? What was the, the feedback you got? It was so overwhelming after that documentary. It was quite like uh, that I felt overwhelmed in those few weeks and days and weeks afterwards because I got thousands of messages and from people that were sinking and I was like, right, I'm going to answer all these messages. And you just can't. You can't. Because you answer one, you know, oh, I'm so sorry and support. And then they, they, they come back with another question. And, you, you know, like it just – and I just was like, what else can I do? And I, yeah, I hadn't really been planning to do anything else. But, um, yeah, there were a number of people that came up to me with really, really heart-wrenching stories. And I was like, okay, I've got to do more in this space. Because it's just – you know, you know when you're in those situations and you're like – whoa, how did I not know about this? Mm. And now I'm in it. And people, no one else knows about it. And I've got to tell people this is a thing. And because the thing is, so many people don't feel like they can talk. So you think you're the only person on this island struggling with your child and trying, you know, with a really unhappy child or a child that's not coping in the world. And then when you put the feelers out, there's so many, but no, everyone's ashamed. There's so much shame. There is so much shame. And that... The sad and heartbreaking and tragic thing is that these kids are amazing. They're just not in an environment that supports that amazingness, and that's what's got to change. What are the stats on how many kids or people in New Zealand this this is affecting? Oh, right. Um, Yeah, we. (laughs) That's another thing. We haven't done stats in New Zealand. ADHD New Zealand are amazing, and they um, have done quite a lot of research recently but we're kind of going by what's happening overseas we could say that 20 percent of the population fit the criteria for a neurodivergent diagnosis so you're talking ADHD autism dyslexia dyspraxia one of those Um, I think it's probably more than that and then that doesn't factor in all those people that are close to a diagnosis but wouldn't meet it but still have real um, issues that impact their lives every day that they just think they're a bit crap, but they're actually, you know, brain just works differently. So, and we just don't know about this stuff. I mean, I, I got an ADHD diagnosis because my daughter's psychologist was like, hey, I screen all the parents. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not, no, that's not mm-hmm. me. No, good, I'm not, no. And he was like, just do the test, Sonia. I was like, okay, I'll do the test. And then he rang me, he was like, he scored 100%. Oh, no. And I was like, the competitive side of me went, yeah, <laughs> nailed it. The other side was like, oh, how does that work? And he told me about inattentive ADHD and, you know, how that my, my mental filing cabinet just doesn't work that well. 
And um, yeah, my mum was like, that just explains a lot about your childhood. Yeah, what has it changed since the diagnosis oh. about you? Like, has it actually changed the way you do things or structure Not your life? Not the way I do, the way I think about myself and the way I, yeah, the way I go, I, I don't expect myself to be able to do the things that maybe society expects of us necessarily, or I'll put things in place, I'll put frameworks in place, and now I can't even think of an example for you, but I'll, I mean, I'm terrible with emails. I have 40,000 unread emails. Ooh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh. I, I just, emails to me are just, I just, like this sort of stuff, this is easy. The email, no, you, you're amazing with the emailing, but like that, I find that quite hard, just going, what's the right thing to say here? Like this is weighing on me. I've got to, you know, I, I need to do this, this and this. And sometimes I over deliver because I'm just not quite sure or I just ignore it. Which is bad. John Kerwin, we had John Kerwin on, said the exact same thing. Emails, just so overwhelming for him. You know, like a simple thing, which appears simple. Is, is yeah, just yeah. And people, people will be listening to this going, just, how, like, just reply to it, just send the, write, type it, send it. That seems simple. But the ADHD brain, one of the big things that people don't know about ADHD is we cannot tolerate boredom mundane tasks or, or using your brain in a way that's kind of has to think logically and you know we're spontaneous we just kind of bang 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 and so things like emailing taxes uh <laughs> taxes is a big one <laughs> um uh, emptying the dishwasher you know stuff like that that is actually physically painful that, bo- that boredom it, 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 boredom's not the right word just we have a lack of dopamine. Now, do, the dopamine, which is your feel good, a feel good hormone, just doesn't deliver in the right way, and so we can't. It, it's just really hard. I, I can't explain it. Are yeah. You, are you, do you, yeah. You know, say, well, you, you were saying that your son is potentially. Yeah, um, and this and only a really recent. Before we started looking into you, maybe only two or three weeks ago, my oh, okay. wife sort of said, like, one of my friends said their kid had ADHD. I went through all the checklist, like, see if you think this is Bo, and it was literally every single thing. I was like, amazing, and we've been having some issues with his behaviour and regulating his emotions and all the sort of stuff. So. The question I wanted to ask is, mm. if you've got a kid who you suspect has ADHD, what's, what's the next step? What, what do you do? Yeah, that's hard. <laughs> um, it's easier if you have money, which is terrible in this country, but it is, it is a long waiting list if you don't, even still long if, if you're private. But I would, so the ADHD New Zealand website is amazing. Um, yeah, go there first and go to your GP. That didn't work in my situation. Way back with Nizi when she was little, they just said, oh, the, my GP just said, oh, you've just got a hungry kid, just give us some juice after school. So, you know, don't don't feel that if you get that response, then, you know, you, you, you have to believe them. You know, you know your kid. You are the expert in your child. And if you know that something's not quite right, explore it. Like, you know, the struggle is that some people do, and I understand this, like labels are a bit scary. Hey, I don't know how you feel about that. Are you a little bit like... A mm. little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to put them in a box. No, no. Yeah. And there, that is the problem with this di- these sort of medical diagnoses is it, it does a little bit put you in a box. But the positives, I think, outweigh the negatives. And we're changing. This whole stigma surrounding you know, ADHD, autism, all the neurodiversities is changing pretty quickly because these are really exceptional brains. So... She says, <laughs> being yeah. ADHD, you know what I mean? It's just yeah. like, it's needed. It's just, yeah. What, what, what else, can I ask what else with your, with your son? Because he's six and it might, it might just be, a fa- it, you know, you don't know. Yeah, just, just all, uh, there's two types of ADHD, right? The- yes, although I think they're blended a bit more than we, we think. But yeah, yeah, there's the impulsive hyperactive. Yeah. So yeah, just can't control that, you know. That's it. That's impulsive, it, right. hyperactive. And yeah. his school said anything? School's fine. Keeps okay. it together at school. Right. Yep. Yeah, yeah, Keeps yeah. Keeps it together at school yeah. and then comes home and it's just, it's all over the place. And it's, because I've got four kids, so I know what, you know, oh, the other yeah, ones yeah, are like. Yeah, You've yeah. got something to compare and yeah, contrast it with. Yeah. And you're like, okay, he gets into these sort of situations and you just can't pull him back and you've got to sort of manage him differently. And like, He's, he's really different to the others. Um, yeah, so there might be a bit of ADHD going on, which is a wonderful thing. Mm-hmm. And it's just about learn. You know, for me, 
you know, very late diagnosed, but just learning about it. And does he have a lot of meltdowns? Yeah. Yeah. So at, just at home, not, in, yeah, not yeah, out yeah. with other people, not at school, just... No, nah, that's sweet. So can I recommend uh, episode eight of No Such Thing as Normal podcast, The Mechanics of Meltdowns, that will change how you look at his meltdowns because okay. that is, uh, it's a physiological response to a threat. Mm. That's perceived threat. Are we going too deep into this? No, not at all. No, okay. You can you can edit anything you nah, want out. No, no, because I, I if I can jump in here again, yeah. I'm sitting on the sidelines. But are you? No, absolutely not. I'm completely no, invested but are, in, are involved. You? <laughs> um, I'll diagnose you with something before we're out. <laughs> yes. and you'll be yeah, you'll be got? here <laughs> on the playing field. <laughs> well, you talked about like labels and things being intimidating, and I look at the list of letters after your daughter. SPD, ADHD, DCD, ASD, dyslexia, OCD, and ODD. Like that must be intimidating as a, as a parent to get this list of things before you have a better understanding of neurodiversity. And that is is that a, is that a, um, is that an accurate well, assumption? For, it, yes, for some people definitely, but for me, I'm like I want to get this sorted. So I she got one diagnosis. I was like, this is not the full picture, and I just. Keep, you know, there's more going on. And so that's, I guess, how she's ended up with lots of diagnoses. All of them, she's a little bit of all of them, but none of them describe who she is. Right. Um, and, you know, from doing this podcast series, I've kind of gone, God, I can see where the drawback with the diagnoses is because we have an idea of what we think, let's say, autism is. Rain Man. You know, yeah. the movie. You it's know, a, like, it's amazing like, that cultural reference point, everyone totally, goes totally. straight there. Or, or just, you know, it's always male and it's always. And then, you know, Nizi does have an autism diagnosis. It's, you know, there is some autism going on, but I kind of don't like to put it out there anymore because people have this idea of who she'll be and what she'll need before she turns up. And she's, you know, oh, she won't need like eye contact, she won't like loud noises, and she won't like this. It's like, no, no, no she's fine with all that stuff. And so that's where the box, putting into the box problem starts. So it's really tricky. It's really tricky. But um, I think the benefits do outweigh the negatives. But, you know, it's so interesting that there's still so much stigma around this stuff. Mm. And people still feel very ashamed to admit that they, you know. It's even, again, it's even like awkward to ask someone who's a parent about that topic. Like I would feel super awkward talking to you about it. Super well, awkward. Well, well, this is the first time I've said publicly. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say that I think my kid has ADHD. You know, I'm not sure if that's all right. It, oh, oh, you, you mean well, your wife wouldn't like it, or well, just partner, that, or? I'm oh, not. This just this is no, such no, no, new that's territory. Okay. Yes, you know, okay. Like if I'm saying in public uh, to twenty thousand people, I think my six year old has ADHD. Like, twenty thousand people. That is a big audience. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, Good flex, bro. <laughs> I'm not sure. Like, I don't, I don't no, no, it's 20,000. It is yeah. 20,000. I'm very sure on that. Um, I think it's great. I think the more people that – because what we have to change is that this whole negative idea about it that, oh, mm. my God, like you saying that is saying there's something wrong with your kid. There is something wrong with the environment for your kid potentially, but there is absolutely nothing wrong with your kid. So that's the shift we've got to make. It's very difficult when you're talking about something which is uh, a te- now what ADHD what does it stand for? Attention deficit hyperactive disorder. Mm. And I'm telling you, there's nothing wrong with it. And you're going, well, it's got disorder. Like, yeah. how can there be nothing wrong with it? So that is a problem. There's lots of you know hurdles that we have to you know cross. But um, th- now with so many people. Being more open, and I'm so grateful to all the people that have been on my podcast. I think it's really brave, you know, because there is still judgment. But every time someone says that, even you're just saying, I think my son might have ADHD, that opens the door for someone else. Because mm. people look up to you. You're cool. Ish. Ish. <laughs> <laughs> jokes. Yeah. Jokes. In that regard, was it a relief to start to talk about it? Because you're a public figure. You're on our screens every week. There's a social expectation maybe – that you pres- Sometimes you- twice a week because Lotto's on twice a week. Big Wednesday. Big Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you, you've got a, you've got a public persona, but then from my research, behind the scenes was hell. Yeah, it really was, and I was it hard. Yes, 
mm, I think I just had to protect my daughter a, a little bit and go, this isn't all my story to tell. So that was really important. Um, but it had been so, so hard. I mean, it was so, and it felt so public anyway. Like she'd have massive meltdowns in the mall, for example. And that's just so, just on so many levels, it's so hard. And I was just like, I, I, I it was more like I have to do it. It wasn't about even, you know, how do I feel about it? This is bigger than me, you know. This is something has got to change. Something Somebody has to talk about this in a different way. Because the other thing was, I was, you know, I was like, okay, so there is this issue with Nizi, where do, you know, on Google, what do I do for help? And it was just like, there's nothing. And it's all really dusty. All the research, resources were at that time were just really like, whoa. And scary. <laughs> and like every, you know, you're like, oh my God, I'm going to have a lifetime of hell. And yeah, I just thought this can't be the story for people coming behind me. Go and watch the documentary on TVNZ, Kids Wired Differently. There's some great examples of what we talk. It's so hard to describe everything we're talking about. But mm. when you see, yeah. when you see Nessie, um, like fiddling with the pillows and the sort of five hour routine of what she had to do every night and the curtains and things. There's another one where you're taking her to school and she doesn't want to get out of the car because you're wearing the wrong pants and you have to go oh, home yeah, and change yeah, yeah. your pants. Yeah. Like that gives an insight into what you're dealing with. Cause you, oh, that was that was not actually the documentary. That was something else. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah another little little thing that, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, and that, and, and again, because I have to protect my daughter, we did not show that much. You know, I have to run everything by her, and she's very protected. Oh, you know, there's certain things she doesn't want. So that was just a tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Um, and she did actually end up in hospital this year um, because her the OCD got completely out of control, and you know, it was she just stopped eating, drinking, like doing anything. It was just straightening the pillows for three days straight. You know, this is this is the sort of stuff, and I know there'll be people listening going. Well, that, yeah, what were you doing? Mm. What were you doing while all this was taking place? And it's so complicated and so massive. So we were very lucky to get into Starship Child and Family Unit. That's a whole other story. That's an amazing, uh, full-on place. That beautiful experience because I stayed with her. But yeah, so that's that's you know it can get bad, and I know I'm not the only one. But then along the way. There's other people that it may not be at that level, but it's still hard. It's still like, what are we? Are we doing it this right? Are we do you know? And those resources aren't there. The support isn't there. You feel like you're on this island, going. Everyone else seems to be handling this whole parenting gig really well, and I'm not. Mm. There's definitely, I think, a lesson in operating with empathy if you're sitting on the outside. Like, um, one of the confronting things from the doco was you talking about having physical bruising from. Um, you know, your situation. And then I think the quote was, it's like domestic abuse, but you can't escape. Mm. And that fucking killed me, man, when I when I heard you describe it like that. And I'd never, I'd never had that lens on it. Um, and I can't imagine the household having to kind of go through that, but then having to front like that, that this, the shame and the stigma attached to it that thankfully has passed for you now but yeah, having to yeah having to put a front on and then deal with those situations so publicly and being a public person as well, like just yeah, man, so much respect for you for for using your platform and standing up for the people that maybe don't have a voice and don't know where they can turn. Mm. It's such an amazing thing that you're doing out there, and I really hope by us putting a spotlight on that to a very maybe different audience than what you're used to can help people kind of navigate those conversations and and, and this area and territory. Like I've learned shitloads and. 24 hours about kind of oh, how to approach awesome. my friends who are parents. Yeah, yeah. And your friends who also might be slightly, you know, shiny like me. Yes. You know, you know yeah, like yeah. they just, I think, you know, a lot of us in relationships, they break down because, you know, the one doesn't understand the other's kind of, how the other's brain works. And I think just a little bit of knowledge, you know, learning about your own brain, this is for everyone, you know, not just those who are neurodivergent. Just is, is so helpful to go, okay, this is how I would have done it and what I would have said, but that's not what Steve is thinking. He's not, he's not even in the same ballpark. He's thinking about something completely different or whatever it is. You know, there's so many things. It's just, yeah, it's, it's, I, I've found it really liberating being able to go, okay, not everyone experiences the world like me. Mm. And that's what you, it's been thrown in my face though with a kid that mm. is just like not coping with the world. And Stephen asked me on the drive up, like, do do I have a 
a history in my family? Do I do I have any experience with it? A hundred percent, I'm sure I do, but it's never been diagnosed. It's probably sat particularly on the in the Pacific Island side of my family. I'm I'm sure it's it, it it's an explanation or a an insight into why people are like they are within our kind of family unit for sure. Yeah, yeah, and you know, if you think if you look at the stats for people with ADHD, ASD, dyslexia, the negative stats. Like dyslexia is the big one. I'm just working on that episode at the moment. And um, th- they over 50% of our prison inmates are dyslexic. But over 50% of our the billionaires, entrepreneur, you know, top entrepreneurs in the world are dyslexic. Mm. So that's kind of bizarre. And it's like there's this fork in the road. That's kind of, I, I just find it so fascinating because the dyslexic brain is fascinating. But if that, you know, all the amazing things about dyslexics, if that's not harnessed, if that's squashed out because they can't read and write that well, then, you know, you can go the other, take that other fork in the road. Which again, thinking back as a kid growing up, it's like, oh, so and so is dyslexic. It was like, oh, don't waste your time hanging out with him. He can't be your friend because he's dyslexic. Like there was such negative stigma. And you really did think they were stupid. Yeah, 100%. And it was the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. They're actually amazing. But there's, it just happens that reading and writing are this, you know, we hi- hold them in such high regard. Like you have to be able to do that before you can do anything. And um, all that creativity, all that like um, just amazingness. That Like NASA, over 60% of their <clears> – <throat> sorry, start again. Like with NASA, over sixty percent of their employees are dyslexic. They seek out dyslexics because they see that visual spatial ability. They can see things in three D. They can, you know, like they actually seek them out. Like, but you've got to, in order to get to that point, you've got to get through all the exams. All the sure, you know, you have reader writers now. That's that's great, but it's not really addressing the problem. 